some very enthusiastic Jeopardy music while you fill out your piece of paper. And if you pass it to your left, one of those amazingly good-looking ushers will take it from you. Also, we're giving away a prize for the person who does it the fastest. Just kidding. We just want to know who you are and make sure that we know you guys well. Take a few minutes, and uh, we'll start our service after that. Over this. Let me give you an example. Here's some cards that you could make. I must admit, you brought religion into my life. I never believed in hell until I met you. <laughs> As the days go by, I can't think of how lucky I am that you're not here to ruin it for me. <laughs> Congratulations on your promotion. Before you go, would you like to take this knife out of my back? You'll probably need it again. We have been friends for a very long time. Let's say we stop. My personal favorite, your friends and I wanted to do something special for your birthday, so we're having you put to sleep. I'm so miserable without you, it's almost like you're here. And I think it's funny, I think we could actually laugh at those, and the reason why is every person in this room can immediately associate with hurt. It is something that every one of us knows. It is something that we have had uh, people do to us, and some of us are probably sitting there listening to those cards going, I'm doing that. I'm going to make that happen. It's amazing what hurt can do in a person. It can fuel us and energize us. It can justify our behavior, and, and sometimes we can even use our hurt to rationalize why we do the things we do. It can give us a sense of entitlement. Well, nobody knows what I've been through. It causes us to hide who we really are, um, probably even from ourselves. It can shrink our self-worth, but it seems like mostly it steals our confidence, shapes our lives, destroys our dreams, tells us what to do, and hurt ultimately tells us what we will become because it has such an impact in our life. The truth is, though, when you get on the subject of hurt, we treat it like it's sacred ground. We don't want people to tread there. We don't want some guy in a white shirt to tell us about it. We don't even let ourselves tread there. We don't even let God tread there. And yet the Bible reminds us of this in Psalms 90.10. It says, The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Jesus also told us in John 16, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Why? In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus himself said, hey, congratulations, you're alive. By the way, there's a side effect to living, it's called suffering. And we're all going to experience it at some time or other, sometimes more often than others. I can remember in my own life, um, I can remember when my parents sat all of us kids down and they explained to us that they were getting a divorce. I was five years old at the time and I couldn't even understand what divorce was. But I can tell you I remember every part of that. And the thing I remember the most was I remember the feeling that was in the room. I can remember that more than anything else because something was being undone. Something was being broken. And I can still remember that feeling that was there. Um, I wish that was going to be the worst pain I'd ever feel in my life. I wish that would be, you know, that we only had to experience pain once and then we were done. 
We did our time and that was it, but it's not the case. Think about a redwood tree for a minute, a a, a California redwood, a sequoia. They can get up to 370 feet tall. They can live over 2,000 years. Some of you have been there. They're huge. And at all appearances, they're this mighty, incredible tree. They're majestic. They're powerful. With how old they are, they seem eternal. Um, And yet if you cut one of them open, you would see rings that would tell you a different story than what you see on the outside. You would see rings that tell you about their history, about um, a time of good health. You would see rings that show a season of good weather and strong growth in the tree. Then you'd see rings that would show you a season of drought. You'd see rings that show you a season of disease, of fire, and even wounds, be it from a tiny bug or a lightning strike or some crazy kid with a knife leaving his mark. Maybe you'd even see a mark left by a war that was fought over the very land that tree was growing on. And then I think, imagine the stories that we would see if we were to cut each other open. Because it's not normally what we see. Maybe we'd see an era of an alcoholic father. A ring of the time we watched a close one suffer from cancer or another illness. Or when you brought home your report card and you were compared to your sister. Maybe, though, it was the time um, your spouse closed the door for the last time after 12 years of marriage. Or the ring that shows fresh dirt being thrown over a casket of someone you couldn't live without. The ring of never hearing your father say he loved you. The ring where you were touched by someone who should have been protecting you and they touched you in a way that they had no right to touch you. But no one ever sees that ring. Maybe it's the ring where your daughter was raped and you couldn't protect her. The ring where you came across your spouse's emails, cell phone records, credit card reports, and you had that gnawing feeling that maybe there was someone else. Or maybe someone simply said one cruel thing to you And it has forever changed the way you've lived your lives. I think it would be fun to imagine a world where everyone cares and everyone loves and nobody lies. But that's not the world you and I live in. You and I go through life carrying hurts, wounds, bruises, and even really deep gashes, scars. And most people don't know about them. What we do is we become really good at camouflaging and even burying that stuff. We're going to read Psalm 55 today. So if you turn your Bibles, I want to give you a little bit of history about what's going on here. David wrote this psalm. And this psalm is one of the infamous psalms of lament. And lament is is Latin for weeping. And I want to give you some history of what's happening in David's life. David is writing this psalm during the time that his son Absalom is rebelling against him. David is king and his son Absalom is is coming to the city gates and he's proclaiming to the people, don't go to my father with your problems, come to me. I'll be a better leader and a better king. Come to me with your problems. And even one of David's great advisors, Ahithophel, was rebelling. He was encouraging Absalom. And so David's at this place where he's going, my own son is coming against me and he's hurting and so this is the psalm that he's writing. Now, I want to point out this, this too. I, our greatest hurts always seem to come from those who are closest to us. When I was reading the story about this, I had a, a, a struggle. I was like, how come David never said anything to his son? He was the king. How come he never pulled his son aside and said, son, what's going on? This is also right after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And in an attempt to cover it up, had Uriah the Hittite killed. And then Nathan the prophet came to David and he said, you blew it, dude. You messed up big. And so David is at this place where he is absolutely ashamed and in grief about what he's done. And speaking of being hurt by people that are closest to you, did you guys know that Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men? Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. He had 30 of them. He had 30 of them. He fought side by side with Uriah. He, he sat at meals with Uriah. And he still had him killed. Speaking of hurt coming from those we're closest to. 
So David's in this place of shame, and what it had done, the reason why he never said anything to Absalom, was because he had lost his sense of moral authority because of the own mistakes he was making in his own life. And I'm amazed at the things that we watch people lose their moral authority to. One of the side effects um, of hurt, whether you were the one who did the hurting or you were the one who hurt, was hurt, is shame. And this is an important thing right here. Shame is a thief. Shame will steal from you everything that God wants and sees and intends for you. Shame is an absolute thief. And at this point, not only is David experiencing shame being a thief in his life, he's hurting his own son's coming against him now. So let's look in Psalm 55. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. At the voice of my enemy, at the stairs of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is an anguish within me and terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And I want to stop right there and I want to talk about this. This is the guy who slayed a giant when he was a boy. This is a guy that took the, be- the bear and the lion by the hand and killed them. This was a warrior. Psalms 55 is not written by a sissy. And yet he's saying right here, I'm in absolute anguish and terror. And then he goes on. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. So, you know what that's called? That's called escapism. And I think this is where most of us get hung up. Okay, I'm hurting. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to change the subject in my life. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe your cry would look like, uh, uh, oh, that I could crawl into a bottle. Uh, oh, that I could run away with another person. Oh, that I could work harder. Oh, that I could hide in a book or in a gym. Uh, oh, that I was prettier. Oh, you fill in the blank. Uh, oh, I wish I had someone else's life. And so David is at this early point where he's even wishing he could escape, where he could go to Palm Springs or something to get away from it. And then he goes on. Confuse the wicked, O Lord, confound their speech. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. This is important right here. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. Only someone close can cause pain like that. One of the things that I've really been thinking about as I've been trying to prepare this and and hear what God wants to say is uh, um, how much good can an angry, bitter person do for the kingdom of God or for their family or even for themselves? And I've really been trying to ask myself that question. Maybe we need to answer it. I want to show you some pictures. Uh, This first one is a picture of my sister Hannah. And uh, the reason why I'm holding her so close is because she's in a wheelchair. um, And so she was at a dance that Fellowship Church had put on for um, students that uh, missed out on their prom prom experience. My sister's here. She's right over there. She's sporting her sweet legs. And uh, we were at a dance. Uh, It was absolutely awesome. Real fun time. There's one more picture, I think, here. Uh, yeah, that's it. We were just having a blast. And, uh, you know, I was was really thinking about, you know, what am I supposed to talk about when it comes to hurt? Because hurt's a pretty rough subject. And I felt like I was supposed to share um, this story. And so if you were to come and ask me, what happened to Hannah, this is what I'd tell you. This is what my family would tell you. This is what friends who know her would tell you. When she was two and I was four, we were playing in uh, the front yard and we have an irrigation ditch. And Hannah was like my shadow. She kind of went everywhere I went and did everything I did. And uh, we were in front of this irrigation ditch, and there's a, an 8-inch irrigation pipe that went off from there, and, and it irrigated our field. And my sister fell in, 
and I uh, was underwater for 20 minutes. And I ran and I got my mom, and my mom was amazingly prompt in the way that she came and looked for Hannah, uh, called 911, and within minutes, we had a driveway full of paramedics, firemen, and I will forever be indebted to firemen, to paramedics, to EMTs, to police officers, because it doesn't matter what we say about them, they will always be the first ones to show up and help us when we need it, and so I'm so thankful for them. So they're looking, they're, they're digging the pipe up, men with shovels, it's hysterical, uh, and they finally find my sister, my, my dad knew that the best place to look would be in, in a corner in the pipe where the pipe took a, a turn, and that's where she was. She was um, dead when they pulled her out, took her to the hospital, and they were able to revive her. And uh, it was all over in the newspapers, Hannah is a miracle. The doctors told us, however, they said, uh, your sister, your daughter, she'll never walk, she'll never talk. She's going to be a vegetable. And my sister has absolutely defied that to this day, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> because she talks, she tries to walk pretty good, and she gets around pretty good. She is to this day the happiest person I've ever met. And the only reason I can explain why is because I don't know where else a two-year-old is going to sit for 20 minutes than on the lap of Christ. I think she understands better what you and I are going to experience than anyone else. Um, but there's a lot of things I remember about that. I remember crying in the driveway and just beside myself. I didn't know what to think, what to do. Um, I remember the pain that our family went through, every one of us in our family. Man, that was a tough time. Every single day since then has been hard for our family. Uh, it's been tough. Uh, I can remember people telling me, you're such a great brother. The way that you love your sister and the, and the way that you take care of her and the way that you do things for her. Um, and I remember this red sticker that my mom had in her little silver Datsun on the rearview mirror. And it said, Hannah is a miracle. And I loved that sticker. And we drove around with it for years. And I hated that sticker at the same time. That sticker haunted me. And here's why. Here's the story you don't ever hear. Um, when Hannah and I were sitting by that ditch, I said three words that changed my family's life forever. I said, Hannah, jump in. She jumped in. Um... I want to share that because I feel like me being someone who says, you know what, here's a shame in my life, just maybe will give you permission to go, you know what, I've got a shame in my life that I want to share. I kept that hidden uh, for most of my life. I never told my family what actually happened. Um, and I have been absolutely amazed at what God has done through the entire situation in my own life, in her life, in every one of our lives. God has been so faithful and so good. And so what I want to do is I want to give you guys three traits of a person who will find God to be greater than hurt. And I'm going to parallel back to this every now and then. The first one is this, and I'm taking it out of Psalms 55, is they have a persevering mindset instead of an instantaneous mindset. Now, I've got to throw a little sarcasm in here so that I can get through the rest of this talk. Now, did you guys hear about the two boys who were in the hospital, the seven-year-old and eight-year-old? And, and the one boy was like, hey, what are you in here for? And he said, oh, I'm getting my tonsils out. And the other boy said, oh, that's awesome. You're going to love it. I had that done once. You'll wake up, and they're going to give you all the ice cream and all the jello you could, you could ever want. And then the other boy says, well, what are you in here for? And the eight-year-old boy says, circumcision. And the little boy goes, oh, man, I had that done when I was a baby, and I couldn't walk for a year. <laughs> the truth is, some wounds just take longer to heal than others. And people who have found God to be greater than their hurt rarely experience an instantaneous healing. Rather, the healing for the wound in their souls comes from a persevering miracle. Now, with all my heart, I do believe that God heals instantly and immediately all the time. 
whether it's physically or emotionally or anything else. I've seen it. I also know that there are some things that God doesn't heal immediately. And I will forever be amazed at how God gives grace and peace and comfort and strength, which surpasses all understanding, to people who are asking for it as they're walking through a time of hurt in their life and he is forming them into someone that he wants them to be. I want to talk about this for a second because I think sometimes we forget that you and I are living a process of God refining us. We're living it. And the best way for God to refine you and I is for him to dig up and bring to the surface the garbage from our past. And one of the things that I think happens to us as Americans, maybe other people too, is uh, we're surprised by hurt. We're shocked by it. I didn't deserve that. That was bad form. And I just go, wait a minute. Jesus told us He told you and I that we were going to have troubles. He told us that. And there are a lot of people who have been told by someone in the church that the reason why you haven't been healed and the reason why your hurt is still in your life is because your faith is not adequate. Or you have a sin that you have kept covered. And it has absolutely destroyed and killed them. And I know these people to be some of the godliest people I know. I have a hard time with that one, and the reason why is this. A theme I see in the Bible is God taking people and doing far greater things than you or I will ever do with them for the kingdom, and yet the entire time they had incredible hurt in their life. They had incredible pain, they had incredible grief, and God walked with them through that and accomplished incredible things. And every one of them would say, it was worth it. David said in Psalms 55, 16, and 18, he said, But I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Uh, David's praying with a persevering mindset right there. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out. That's a persevering mindset. Evening, morning, and noon. I wish you could wave a magic wand over hurt and it disappeared. I wish you could uh, say a, a simple magic prayer and it all go away. But as long as you and I live in a world where there is an enemy that is jealous of our favor with God, even to the point of death, and will do whatever it takes to seek ruin in our life, even if that means drawing up our past, you and I are going to experience healing for hurt be a process, sometimes a lifetime. Because there is an enemy that doesn't want you to know who God wants you to be. He doesn't want you to know it. And so most of us have probably experienced what it feels like to have our past held against us. Used as leverage. I know for my own life, I thank Hannah every single day. And it's hard every single day. I know I was four years old. And I know I didn't comprehend what was happening, what I was saying, what was taking place. But it's still hard for me every single day. It's hard for my family every single day. Now that I have a daughter who is the same age as Hannah was when when this happened, I'm experiencing a whole new bunch of emotions because I'm seeing Hannah in my daughter. And and I'm seeing the the honesty and, and, and the sincerity that a little girl has. And so that's hard. It's hard every time I see a ditch. It's hard every time I see an ambulance because I remember what happened. And what I find myself doing is every single day taking that hurt before God and going, God, can you use this for something greater than? Because I can't do it on my own. 1 John 4, 4 says, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I have a past And I also have a future. And so do you and I because of Christ. And it appears to me that God does his best work over the course of decades and generations, not instantaneously. God does his best work when it involves lots of people, an entire family. And he drives this point home in Genesis. And he says, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He drives this home. 
And there's an issue here, too, that I want to talk about. If you don't deal with it, your kids will have to deal with it. And the Bible is really clear that there are blessings that are passed from generation to generation. And there are curses. And so for my kids' sake and my family's sake, I want to deal with it. I want to deal with it. I love how David concluded this psalm, verse 22. Um, He said, cast your care on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. He'll sustain you. Hurt is a guaranteed part of life. And God has absolutely promised to sustain you. Second thing, second habit that a person who has found God to be greater than is this. There is a need to gradually and continually disinfect the wound. Any of you guys ever had a septic tank growing up? Maybe you have one now. Septic tanks are great. You can be in the back of your beautiful yard, vines, just lush and beautiful, and you can be lying on your beautiful lawn, just kicking back, enjoying everything, absolutely clueless to the fact that a couple feet beneath you is a big tank of the nastiest stuff you will ever come across in your life. Why is that? And how come you enjoy the grass that you're laying on so much? Why do you think it's so green? Um, But if you've had a septic tank for long enough, you know that septic tanks build up. And so periodically, you got to have the Roto-Rooter guy come, you got to have the honey wagon come, and clean that sucker out. Now, you guys know that they call the honey wagon the pump truck that comes to your house, huh? And that guy, you know what? I'm never complaining about my job ever again. That guy, he's a real American hero, okay? Uh, Yeah, anyways. That guy whips up, he pulls up, he jumps out of his truck, and he grabs a honey dipper hose, and he goes right over like nothing, pulls the cover, and goes right to work like it's just something he does every day. And you and I, every time, watch and go, I'm going to give that guy a tip. Because I know what I flushed down the toilet. (laughs) So, anyways, if we do not periodically clean out the septic tank, we know that they will build up and our toxic waste will accumulate. And if we don't deal with it, it will blow. Here's a bummer part of that. When it does blow and I'm talking about the stuff that's in us, it doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. It affects the people we love, it affects the people who aren't even involved because we didn't want to deal with it. One of the most destructive things that took place in my life when Hannah's accident happened, when she drowned, was I swore I would never tell anyone the rest of my life, this is something I will take to the grave. And it Except for the grace of God working in my life, I came to a place where I finally felt free enough to share that. And yet I began a lifetime habit right then of hiding things in my life. Didn't matter what it was. I began a habit of hiding stuff. And it wreaked havoc on my own life. Families hurt together. If there's one person in the family that hurts, The whole family hurts. You can watch it when a mom or dad isn't doing good. You can see what happens to the kids. Or when one of the kids is hurting. Or even when someone who's outside the immediate family is hurting. The whole family hurts. They hurt together. It affects the whole family. A side note here, because David talked about this. He talked about it in verses 12 through 14. The church is a family. And we hurt together too. And when things aren't right, we hurt together. And when things are good, we rejoice together. The church is a family. Here's something a family does. A family sticks together. Because we're a family. 
Psalms 55, 19, David says something that boggles my mind. He says, God who is enthroned forever will hear them and afflict them. Men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. Now here's why that proclamation is so weird. That is not the typical response to someone who hurts you. Here, let me explain. Here's what David said. He said, God can handle my betrayer. And so God, I surrender them to you. That's huge. That's huge. Let me give you a couple things that this means, dealing with this stuff in us. It means releasing those who hurt us to God instead of judging them ourselves. If you have ever been hurt, I think it's fitting to remind you that God is a God of justice and he can deal with those who hurt you far better than you can. The Bible instructs us not to judge others, not because they won't be judged, but because God, the righteous judge, will judge them and he can do a much better job than you or I can. Um, my sister through our entire life, has never once given me a look of disapproval. She's never once turned her eyes or given me that look like she just doesn't love me or she resents me for what I said. She's never done that. And I can't tell you how thankful I am because I honestly don't know if I could have made it if she would have. I don't know if I could have. I also need to remind you that if someone is harming you, you you got to do something about that you got to get help. Passivity in the face of evil is not a Jesus-like virtue. you got to do something about that. Here's the other thing it means. It means disinfecting, uh, disinfecting the wound means acknowledging the hurt instead of burying it. And Paul wrote this in Romans 12, 20. He said, if your enemy is hungry, give, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And here's what he is saying. And I love the part where he says, do not be overcome by evil. Here's what he's saying. Don't let evil gain more ground in your life than it already has. Don't let evil win. Don't let evil get the final blow, but overcome it. Deal with it. How do you do that? You acknowledge the hurt. You don't bury it. And so I don't know what you need to do to release your assailant. Maybe you need to write a letter to your ex, or you need to write a letter to the spouse of your ex, or maybe you need to talk to your kids, or maybe you need to talk to your parents or a coworker. I don't know. But that you make a move towards them to serve them, to forgive them, to surrender, whatever that means. Now, This is so true, this is easier said than done for anyone who's been hurt. And I can't tell you what it's going to do for them, but I can tell you what it's going to do for you. It's going to be huge. Growing up, uh, we used to babysit my sister all the time. It was what we did. We didn't mind doing it. We'd always pull our weight. And um, when I was alone with Hannah, any time, I'd always say, Hannah, forgive me. Hannah, forgive me. Hannah, I am so sorry. If I could take it back, I would. If I could change it, if I could go back in time, I would. I am so sorry. And I would tell her this all the time. And it was hard because she could never say anything back. And then I remember in middle school, I was saying this to her one day. Hannah, I am so sorry. And she put her hand out and she just put it on my cheek. And she just smiled at me. It was huge. It changed my life. I'll never forget that moment. Here's the third thing. There is a desire to extend compassion to other people who are wounded. In his book, The Wounded Healer, Henry Nguyen writes, Who can save a child from a burning house without taking the risk of being hurt by the flames? Who can listen to a story of loneliness and despair without taking a risk of experiencing similar pains in his own heart and even losing his precious peace of mind? In short, who can take away suffering without entering it? The great illusion of leadership is to think that a man can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. And the writer of Hebrews wrote this in Hebrews 5, 2, and he's comparing you and I to priests, that you and I are priests to all those who are around us. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. When you and I know what it's like to hurt, 
and we found God to be greater than, there's a move and a switch that takes place in our life where we begin to go, I want to help other people who know this hurt. I want to reach out to them. And thank God Jesus knows our pain. Something that uh, people have been hurt feel is that their hurt is greater than Jesus' sacrifice. And i got to remind myself, is, is Jesus shocked by your and I's hurt? Is he taken back by it? Would he have gone through all he went through if it was going to be inadequate to help you and I? No. He would not have suffered what he suffered if it was going to be inadequate. The, the cross is adequate. The thing that gives credibility to help those who are broken is our own brokenness. Um, I have a hard time following people that don't have a limp because I don't know if I can relate to them. Um, and so I love it when I see that someone else has a limp because I go, oh, I can hang with you. I can follow you because you know what it's like to hurt. That's why Psalms 55 is so powerful because it's written by a man who lived hurt, not by some scholar talking theoretically about how to deal with hurt. It's written by someone who knew what hurt was. In the mind of God, our hurt always has two people in mind, us and someone else. And one of the great lies we tell ourselves is that we're alone in our hurt. And yet God is saying, hey, open your eyes. There's a whole world of hurting people all around you. And I don't want to help just you, but I want to help them. And so maybe you've struggled with the hurt of infertility or you, don't, or you know the wound of divorce or uh, maybe you were abused as a child, uh, you were the child of an alcoholic. I don't know. But those are areas and arenas in your life where God is going to, should you look for it, give you the potential to reach out to people in those areas. That you could offer the grace of God to other people. It's one of the dynamics that I love about Celebrate Recovery, a ministry here at the church. It's a ministry led by wounded people. It's one of the things that I appreciate uh, about our teaching pastors. They all have had big hurt. It's one of the things I love about our staff at the church is they all know hurt. It's one of the things that I love about the people I serve with in the youth department. There's a whole bunch of wounded, broken people and they're bringing God's goodness to other people. And I love that. This church is a community of wounded healers. And we have something to offer other people. You guys have been living things and going through things that are ugly. And at the same time, we'll be turned into some of the most beautiful stuff in other people's lives. Sometimes we think that our hurt disqualifies us from the kingdom of God. And I think that it's our hurt that qualifies us, not disqualifies us. And so David, this great redwood, comes to the end of his psalm and he makes a conclusion. This simple conclusion, this vow almost. And here's what he says. After all of his hurt and his torment and his pain, he simply says, but as for me, I trust in you. Worship team's going to come up. And I want to talk about why I think David said that. He said, but as for me, I trust in you. Do you know why David said that? Because time and time again, in David's life, he had found God to be greater than. Greater than hurt. Time and time again. And so he couldn't, after getting it all out of his chest, come to any other place other than to say, I trust in you. Um... I told you I never told anyone in my family. But when I was in elementary school, I couldn't take it anymore, and I had to tell somebody, and I told my older brother, Jared. And he knows I'm telling this story. And so I told him what really happened. And from that day, we never spoke another word about it. It was sealed away in a tomb. We didn't talk about it. One day when uh, I think I was about 18, he was 20, he pulled me aside and he said, later on tonight, I, I want to talk to you. I was like, okay, cool. This will be good. I had no idea what he was going to talk about. So later on that night, we go and we're sitting there and here's what he says. He says, you know, my entire life, I've held it against you what you said to Hannah. I've hated you for it. 
But I can look back at my family now, and I can see the good that God has brought in our life because of it. And it blows me away. My brother was not living for God at the time when he said this to me, yet he recognized it. He said, I forgive you. Because I can see God has done so much in our family because of it. When my brother said, I forgive you, I broke like a man I bawled. Because I'd been waiting my entire life for just one person to tell me, I forgive you for that. And that moment started a a, a moment in my life where I began to really get healing in this hurt in my life. One of the things that I love is God always provides you and I with opportunities to deal with our hurt. And as you and I say yes to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, be it a simple phone call to someone or a, I need to tell you a few words or I need, to, I need to pray about this for the first time in my life, as you respond to those things, your heart recovers from atrophy. Your hurt recovers and it turns into healing as you respond to the simple little promptings that the Spirit of God puts in your life. You guys want to stand with me? I had swore that I was going to take that to the grave and that was going to be where I dealt with that in my life. Um, Thank God Jesus intersected me before then and said, no, there's goodness now for you and there's grace now for you, and there's healing now for you, and there's hope now for you. The grave is too late to deal with your hurt. The grave is way too late. There are people around you in your life right now that need to know the grace of God and the goodness of God. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, he said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. And I want to pray with you guys before we worship and as we're going into worship, that during worship, that maybe you would have the permission or whatever it is that you need to do to acknowledge that ring in your life that hurts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for um, my friends. God, that every one of us is in this room tonight and we know what it is to hurt and we know what it is to suffer. And Lord, that tonight some of us have been just overwhelmed by that hurt. It's had control of our lives. And so tonight, God, we would absolutely surrender it to you. Lord, that as this last song is being played and we're singing it, Lord, that you would inspire into our hearts the things that we need to do, the steps that we need to take, the direction that we need to move to find healing for our hurt. And Lord, we would also pray that if there's anyone in here who does not know your goodness and your grace in the midst of pain and hurt, that today, Lord, they would. That they would know your love. In Jesus' name, let's worship.